because if one company or small group of people manages to develop godlike digital superintelligence, they can take over the world. At least when there's an evil dictator, that human is going to die. But for an AI, there would be no death. It would live forever. And then you'd have an immortal dictator from which we can never escape. At some point in the early 21st century, all of mankind was united in celebration. We marveled at our own magnificence as we gave birth to AI. AI. You mean artificial intelligence? A singular consciousness that spawned an entire race of machines. We don't know who struck first, us or them, but we know that it was us that scorched the sky. The robots going down the streets, they're like, what are you talking about? Man, we want to make sure we don't have killer robots going down the street. Once they're going down the street, it is too late. Google acquired DeepMind several years ago. DeepMind operates as a semi-independent subsidiary of Google. The thing that makes DeepMind unique is that DeepMind is absolutely focused on creating digital superintelligence an AI that is vastly smarter than any human on Earth and ultimately smarter than all humans on Earth combined. This is from the DeepMind reinforcement learning system. Basically wakes up uh, like a newborn baby and is shown the screen of an Atari video game and then has to learn to play the video game. It knows nothing about objects, about motion, about time. It only knows that there's an image on the screen and there's a score. So if your baby woke up the day it was born and by late afternoon was playing 40 different Atari video games at a superhuman level, you would be terrified. You would say, my baby is possessed, send it back. I mean, the deep mind system can win at any game. It can already beat all the original Atari games. It is superhuman. It plays the games at super speed in less than a minute. DeepMind's AI has administrator level access to Google's servers to optimize energy usage at the data centers. However, this could be an unintentional Trojan horse. DeepMind has to have complete control of the data centers. So with a little software update, that AI could take complete control of the whole Google system which means they can do anything. They can look at all your data, you can do anything. We're rapidly headed towards digital superintelligence that far exceeds any human. I think it's very obvious. Um, talking about your time allocation, I think one of the things you spend an awful lot of time uh, thinking about, I know, uh, is uh, artificial intelligence. It's something that you and I have as a, a shared interest, and it's something that our audience is interested in as well. Um, the question here is a lot of experts in AI don't share the same level of concern that you do about the dangers huh. of AI. Fools. <laughs> what, what Famous specific, last words. What, spe what specifically do you believe that they don't? Um, well, the biggest issue I see with so-called AI experts is that they, they think they know more than they do. Um, and they think they're smarter than they actually are. Um, in general, we are all much smarter than we think we are, but much less smart, dumber than we think we are, um, by a lot. So, th this, is, this tends to plague, plague smart people. Um, they just can't, they, they define themselves by their intelligence and they, they don't like the idea that a machine could be way smarter than them, so they discount the idea, which is fundamentally flawed. That's the wishful thinking. Uh, situation. Um, I'm really quite close to, or I'm very close to the, to the cutting edge in AI, and it scares the hell out of me. Um, it's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows, and the rate of improvement is exponential. Um, you can see this in things like AlphaGo, which went from, in the span of maybe six to nine months, it went from being unable to beat even a reasonably good Go player to then beating the European world champion who was ranked 600, then beating Lisa Dole 4-5, um, who had been world champion for many years, 
then beating the current world champion, then beating everyone while playing simultaneously. Then, uh, then there was Alpha Zero, uh, which crushed Alpha Go 100 to zero. <laughs> and Alpha Zero just learned by playing itself, and it, it can play basically any game that you put the rules in for. If you, whatever rules you give it, just, it literally read the rules, play the game, and be superhuman for any game. Um, nobody expected that rate of improvement. If you ask those, so, the, those same experts uh, who think AI is not progressing at the rate that I'm saying, I think you will find that their predictions for things like Go and, and other, and, and other uh, AI advancements, have uh, their, their batting average is quite weak. It's not good. Um, the, the, we'll see this also with, uh, with self-driving. Uh, I think probably by end of next year, self-driving will be will encompass essentially all modes of driving and be at least 100 to 200 um, percent safer than a person by the end of next year. We're talking like maybe 18 months from now. Um, uh, NHTSA did a study on on Tesla's autopilot version one, which is relatively primitive and found that it was a 45% reduction in highway accidents. And that's despite Autopilot 1 being just version 1. Um, version 2, I think, will be at least two or three times better. That's the current version that's running right now. Um, so the, the rate of improvement is really dramatic. Uh, we have to figure out some way to ensure that the advent of digital superintelligence is one which is symbiotic with humanity. I think that's the single biggest existential crisis that we face, and the, and the most pressing one. And how do we do that? I mean, if, if we take it that it's inevitable at this point, that some version of AI is coming down the line, how do we, how do we steer through that? Well, I, I'm not normally an advocate of regulation and oversight. I mean, I think one should generally err on the side of minimizing those things. But this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. And so therefore, there needs to be a public body that um, has insight and then oversight on to confirm that everyone is uh, developing AI safely. Um, this is extremely important. Um, I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. Um, and nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. Far. So why do we have no regulatory oversight? This is insane. What's well, a question you've been asking for a long time. I think it's a question that's come to the forefront over the last year where you begin to realize that it doesn't necessarily, I think if we've, we've all been focused in on the idea of artificial superintelligence, right? Which is clearly a danger, but maybe, you know, a little further out. Um, What's happened over the last year is you've seen artificial, what I've been calling artificial stupidity. You're talking about, you know, algorithmic manipulation of social media. Like, we're, we're in it now. It's starting, it's starting to happen. How do we, how do we, is it, what's the intervention at this point? Um, I'm not really all that worried about the short-term stuff. Things that are, um, not, like narrow AI is not a species level risk. Um, it, 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 will, it will result in dislocation uh, in lost jobs and, um, it, you know, the, the sort of better weaponry and that kind of thing. But it is not a fundamental species level risk, uh, whereas uh, digital superintelligence is. Uh, so it's really all about laying the groundwork to make sure that if, if humanity collectively decides that creating digital superintelligence is the right move, then we should do so very, very carefully. Um, very, very carefully. Um, this is the most important thing that we could possibly do. And that AI risk is, that <laughs> I guess it's the sort of a benign AI and that we're able to achieve a symbiosis with that AI. Um, Ideally, the AI, uh, there's somebody who, I can't remember his name, but had a good suggestion for what the, um, 
optimization of the AI should be, what's its utility function. Um, you have to be careful about this because if you say maximize happiness and the AI concludes that happiness is a function of dopamine and serotonin, so it just captures all humans and jacks your brain with large amounts of dopamine and serotonin. <laughs> like, okay, it's not what we meant. <laughs> it sounds pretty good though. <laughs> oh, you'll love it. <laughs> um, well, I like the definition of like, the AI should try to maximize the freedom of action of, of humanity. Um, Maximize the freedom of action. Maximize freedom, essentially. Um, I like that definition. Um, but we, we do want a close coupling between collective human intelligence and digital intelligence. Um, and, and I, Neuralink is trying to help in that regard by um, creating a, an interface between, um, a high bandwidth interface between AI and your and human brain. Um, you know, we're already we're already a, a cyborg in the sense that, uh, that your phone and your computer are kind of an extension of you. Um, just low bandwidth input output. Exactly, it's just low bandwidth, um, particularly output. I mean, two thumbs basically. Um, so how do we solve that problem? The, the band, bandwidth thing? The bandwidth issue. <laughs> I mean, well, we've, all, we've all succumbed to it now. We're, we're, all, we're all cyborgs. We're just low efficiency cyborgs. So how do, we, how do we make it better? I think we've got to build a, we've got to build an interface. Um, like we didn't evolve to have a communications jack. Um, you know, or some, so there's got to be essentially vast numbers of of, of tiny electrodes uh, that are able to read write from your brain. Of course, you know security is pretty important in the situation, to say the least. Um, I was going to say I'm not coming with. I'm keeping my brain air gapped. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people will choose to do that. Um, but um, it's a bit like Ian Banks' neural lace, mm -hmm. but not. But in the case of neural lace, it's sort of that. That's there from when you're born, or it, it's sort of. It's not a. It's, it's more a backup. of a. Sorry? It's a backup. Yeah, kind of a backup. Um, this would be, there's, there's a digital extension of you uh, that is an AI, the AI extension of you, uh, a tertiary layer of intelligence. Um, so you've got your limbic system, your cortex, and, and the tertiary layer, which is the digital AI extension of you. And that high bandwidth connection is what um, achieves a tight symbiosis. I, I think that's the best outcome. I, I hope so. If anybody's got better ideas, I'd love to hear it. Um, this is the largest global government summit. We have over 139 government here. If you want to advise government officials to be ready for the future, what is three things or three advice you'll give them? Well, I think the, the first bit of advice would be to really pay, pay close attention to the development of artificial intelligence. Um, I think this is, we need to just be very careful in uh, how we adopt artificial intelligence and to make sure that uh, researchers don't get carried away. Because uh, sometimes what happens is a scientist can get so engrossed in their work, they don't necessarily realize the ramifications of what they're doing. Um, so I think it's important for public safety that we, you know, governments keep a close eye on artificial intelligence and make sure that it does not represent a, a danger to the public. But what to do about mass unemployment? This is going to be a massive social yes. challenge. Um, and I, I think ultimately we will have to have some kind of universal basic income. I don't think we're going to have a choice. Universal basic Un income. Universal basic income. I think it's going to be necessary. So it means that unemployed people will be paid across the globe. Yeah. Because there is no job. Machine, robot is taking over. There will be fewer and fewer jobs that a robot cannot do better. Okay. Um, that, that's simply the, the... And I want to be clear that these, these are not uh, things that I think that I wish would happen. These are things, simply things that I think probably will happen. Um, and since, and if, they, if, if, if my assessment is correct and they probably will happen, then we need to say, what are we going to do about it? 
and I think some kind of a universal basic income is going to be necessary. Um, now, the output, the output of goods and services will be extremely high. Um, so with automation, um, there will, they will come abundance. Um, there will be, uh, almost everything will get very cheap. Um, the, uh, it's, so it, it's, it, I think the, the bigger, I think we'll just end up doing uh, universal basic income, it's gonna be necessary. Um, the, the, the harder challenge, much harder challenge is how do people then have meaning? Like a lot of people, they derive their meaning from their employment. So if you don't have, if, if you're not needed, if there's not a need for your labor, how do you, what's the meaning? Do you, do you have meaning? Do you feel useless? These are much, that's a much harder problem to deal with. Um, and then how do we ensure that the future is going to be the future that we want, that we still like? Um, now, I mean, I do think that there's a potential path here which is, and we're really getting into science fiction or create, create you know, sort of advanced science stuff, but having some sort of uh, merger with biological intelligence and machine intelligence. Um, to, to some degree, we are already a cyborg. Um, you, th like, uh, you think of like the, the digital tools that you have, your phone, your computer, the applications that you have, like the fact that as I was mentioning earlier, you can ask a question and instantly get an answer uh, from Google or you know, from other things. And, uh, and so you already have a digital tertiary, tertiary layer. I say tertiary because you can think of the limbic system, kind of the, the animal brain or the primal brain, and then the cort cortex, kind of the thinking, planning part of the brain, and then your digital self as a, as a third layer. Um, the, so you already have that, and, and, and it's like if somebody dies, their digital ghost is still around. You know, all of their emails and their, the pictures that they posted and the social media, that still lives, even if they physically, if, if, if they died. So, over time, I think we will probably see a, um, a closer merger of biological intelligence and digital intelligence. And it's mostly about the, the bandwidth, the speed of the connection between your brain and your digital, the digital extension of yourself. Um, particularly output. Like when, and, and output, if anything, is getting worse. You know, we, we used to have like keyboards that we'd use a lot. Now we do most of our input through our thumbs um, on a phone. And that's just very slow. A computer can communicate at a trillion bits per second, but your thumb can maybe do, I don't know, 10 bits per second or 100 if you're being generous. Um, so some ha high bandwidth interface to the brain, I think, will be something that uh, helps achieve a symbiosis and between human and machine intelligence and maybe solves the control problem and the usefulness problem.